Good afternoon and welcome. The Monday, March 5th, 2018, Board of Commissioners is now in session. The Reverend Frank Custer has been kind enough to give us the invitation and pledge. If you could all please rise. May the Lord be with you. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to come and tend to the business of Currituck County and the, and the wonderful people that live here. Father God, we ask that you would just pour your spirit out upon this room tonight. And Father, may all who speak and hear and listen, Father, we ask that you would just uh, touch them, be with them. And Father, may you be glorified in all of our discussion tonight as we uh, take on the future for our community. And Father, we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please join me with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Custer. You may be seated. First item this evening is approval of the agenda. Much approved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to public comment. I've got a few folks signed up here for public comment this evening. Um, if you would, uh, please limit your comments to three minutes. The, the lights up there will, will tell you um, when to start, when you started, when you're getting close, and red means stop. Um, please uh, be mindful of that as there are several folks that want to speak this evening. Uh, please be respectful, um, as others will be respectful to you. And with that, I will call Miss Sandra Schneerda. Good evening, everyone. I am Sandy Schneerla with Virginia Four Wheel Drive Association. Um, the last meeting that we were here, there was some discussion on the beach parking uh, permit ordinance change. And uh, I have some more comments on that, if I may. First, I want to find out if the commission has come up with an absolute definition of parking. I know that in the ordinance, it was said that if you wanted to stop and take a picture, that was fine and those type things, but, but what is actually the definition of parking? Can I sit there for a minute and take a picture? Can I sit there in a minute and look, pick up a seashell? Uh, those type things. So I, I think that maybe that is going to be a hiccup that uh, comes up in the future if you don't have a definitive definition for parking. The other thing is the ownership of roads. We've been contacted by many um, Currituck County residents, property owners, um, and people that just go to the beach, and they, they all seem to think that the, the road ownership uh, varies. So I have maps. I don't know if I can present them to you for, for use for, for future or not. Where you dump off onto the access, the paved road onto the sand, it is owned by the state of North Carolina. Uh, a little bit further down, it's owned by the United States government. You will also see that many of the tracks of privately owned property extend into the water. Um, so those are some concerns and questions that we also have of the the parking permits. Are we actually going to be on private property? Right now, the property owners don't don't limit us to that. Um, but just finding out if Currituck County actually has um, the authority to proceed with the parking permits in the areas that you want to have them. Would you like the maps? Yes, sure. please. Thank you. Yeah. Who may I give them to? Thank you, Ms. Neerda. Those comments will be addressed in the meeting this evening. I would call Kathy, Catherine Christian. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Catherine Christian, family property owner and summer resident at 529 Conk Crescent, Corolla, North Carolina. Back in the early 1980s, my family purchased a small cottage in the Ocean Sand South subdivision. We have never rented it out. It was an investment in our family relationships. At that time, there was little development in the northern beaches. Horses would travel as far down south as Sanderland, sometimes further. Beaches were sparsely populated during the day, and oceanside bonfires would bring gatherers together in the evening. It was pure bliss. These are the precious memories of my childhood that my two young children will never experience. 
As the secret that was Kerala got out, development sent in. Over the past 30 plus years, we've seen many changes, some for the better. Who wasn't eternally grateful when that food lion first opened? Some we could have done without, but as a family, we all understood. Gone is the sand path through the dunes, and my mother has gotten to the age that she can no longer climb the ladder-like stairs required to get down to the beach. Now, even in Ocean Sand South, the beaches are so crowded with young partiers that my children often experience drunkenness, profanity, and nudity on a regular basis. Our family beach is completely gone. Currently, our one respite is the four-wheel drive beach area in Corova. Our family of 17, we have but one beach-capable vehicle. Once a year, we load my mother up and drive her down to the beach, where we always find plenty of parking and space for us to enjoy. It's my understanding that property owners will be provided vehicle parking passes. However, in our family, our one capable vehicle is not registered to my mother. After 30 plus years of paying taxes, will my mother be refused parking on the beach because the vehicle is not registered in her name? Will she be forced to pay the exorbitant fees that you all are proposing? Let's take a look at those fees. A quick Google search of the four-wheel drive beaches in North Carolina brings up six other beaches, five which require paid permits. The average yearly fees for these beaches is $75, half of what you all are asking. The daily permits average in at $23, less than half of your proposed fees. Your proposed fees are not within industry standard, and it makes me wonder what the true intention behind these fees could possibly be. It has been no secret that these fees aim to eliminate the so-called day trippers, who according to the EDAB, quote, come from DARE and do not increase the value of the experience of the off-road area. Where's the data that supports this? I could find no such data online or otherwise. In my experience, day trippers come not only from DARE, but from the paved areas of Currituck County and semi-local areas of the Outer Banks. These visitors stop at the grocery stores, gas stations, restaurants, and shops. Are these business owners ready and willing to lose that income? Please understand, I am not wholly opposed to beach parking permits. However, as a family property owner and summer resident, I feel this plan has not been completely thought out and is currently structured will not produce your desired outcome. In March of last year, the Virginian Pilot published an article stating Cap Cape Hatteras National Seashore saw an increase in permits to 36,000 last year alone. Obviously, requiring a permit does not decrease traffic on the beach. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christian. Edward Ponton. My name is Edward Ponton, and I live at 1260 Ponton Lane, Kerala. Um, I'm really not sure why I'm here. I actually was thinking this afternoon, why, why go over? Why go over there? Um, it's a long drive for just a few minutes. And I, I thought about Miss Etheridge and her kind of issues with the county a few years ago and watching her up here every, every meeting speaking at the public comment. And I thought of Mr. Hall voting no at the last meeting for this proposal and just thinking, well, um, you know, that, that, takes, you know, that takes some, I think, courage to stand against the grain. And so I decided to drive over here, and I ran into Miss Overstreet, who um, was here at the last meeting and at the Virginia line. I was about to go through the gate. And um, she was looking at the storm damage that's kind of ongoing right now. And she said, you're going over there? You know it's going to pass. And I said, yeah, I know it's going to pass, but I, I probably I just felt like I should come over anyway because it's a civic duty and it's something I wanted to do. Um, I just don't think – I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. I don't see how this is laid out well to implement by May. And that's that's my concern. I'd be much more comfortable if you all were saying – Yes, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it for 2019, which would give us the time to figure out how to do it well. Ms. Gilbert, you mentioned last meeting that you've this board's been talking for eight years about it. The boards before you have been talking about it, and it's time to do something. But I don't think that means it's a time to do something in a manner that's not done well. Um, you're putting a lot of burden on county staff to figure out a lot in a short period of time when we've already made some changes for this year. We don't know what what those changes are going to bring. Lots of unanswered questions with this plan, um, from my perspective anyway. It's just my humble thoughts. Um, don't really have anything, other to, anything else to say other than that. I appreciate your time. I'm going to leave now and head back to Sandbridge to get on the beach before the tide is too high because it is running high, and I hope you don't um, take offense at that, that I'm not going to wait for the rest of the meeting for the outcome of the decision. 
appreciate your time, appreciate your service to the community, and just felt like it was my duty to come in and challenge you a little bit. Hope you have a great night. Thank you, Mr. Ponton. Mark Mormundo. Was I close? Good evening, guys. Good evening. Uh, the four-wheel uh, drive area is a place I've been coming to since I was 16 years old. Mark, if you could state oh. your address for me. Thank you. Oh, I live in Virginia Beach at 1533 Hubble Court in Virginia Beach. Okay. But uh, I've been coming down here since I was like 16 years old, first got my driver's license to this beach. Uh, I'm part of the membership for Tidewater Broncos, who does a beach cleanup down there every year. And uh, it's gotten bigger every year. We get more people down there cleaning that beach up and trying to take care of some issues that are down there. Uh, I just don't, I don't think the, the parking permit is the way to do this. I think there probably should be a, a fee for entering the beach on kind of a daily basis, or if that's what you need to do, like an easy pass system or something along that line. But uh, I think with the parking permit, it's going it, to, it rises some different things come up. Again, what some other people have already stated about who owns the, who owns the, the beach area itself. Do the property owners down there own that beach? Uh, does the state own the beach, and where does the where does that lie? That's really all I have. I mean, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Jim Wheeler. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Wheeler. I live at 191 Beachwood George Drive, Moyock. Um, I sent everybody on the board an email a couple of weeks ago, and I appreciate everybody's response and and at least saying thank you for your for your input. I don't know the reason for this parking permit ordinance. I see a safety thing, and, and one of the commissioners, I don't remember from Mr. White, if that mentioned that back to me in, in an email, was about safety. Uh, I've never seen a parked vehicle injure anybody. Okay. And I, I agree with what the last gentleman here said. I think it would make more sense to put a gate at the, at the horse fence. I'm over there right now in the wintertime at least twice a week on this beach. Um, I have dodged traffic in the wintertime. I dodged it yesterday. I was over there yesterday for about six hours on the beach. I think it would make more sense to put a fence, or not a fence, a, a gate at the horse fence, and just like the last gentleman said, charge a driving fee. You're going to collect the money. People are still going to have to pay to get on that beach. If they don't pay, they can't park. Uh, parking fee, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I think a driving, driving fee would be, make more sense. That's what they have at Hatteras. They have a driving pass. You can park after you get your driving pass. You put one person on the gate to work that gate to collect the money. You're not paying for two or three deputies a day overtime pay for them, which I know how much they make. I've worked with these guys for the last 23 years. I know what they make, and I know what overtime makes. You're paying for one person to collect the fees and hand out a, t a, a parking pass. You can get one for a week if you're going to be there for seven days. Or if you're only going to make a one-day trip, you pay $10, $15, whatever it is. Tourists are still going to come. You're not going to drive them off. But I think they would be more happy with doing that and, and still being able to park. Because a lot of people go up there and park. They spend the whole day. They'll spend 10 hours parked in one spot. That's not a danger to anybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Mike Brigham. Gentlemen, ladies, I'm not from here. I'm from Newport News, Virginia. One five, or excuse me, five five eight Eleanor Court, Apartment J. We travel down here quite frequently. I've been coming down here since 1967. It's a few years, and uh, I don't remember paying anybody anything years ago. And I know things have changed. Politics have changed. The amount of money that required for this changes. All of those things do. But parking, I'm handicapped. Does that mean you're not going to charge me? A lot of places don't charge handicapped for parking. So parking sounds a little bit of a misnomer to me. I mean, is the question, are you going to charge for someone who is driving through and doing nothing more, just enjoying the scenery? I come down to fish. I've been coming down since 67, like I said. I've spent a lot of money down here, an awful lot of money. And I don't expect to be able to tell you people what to do. This is your property. This is your town. But we do visit it. We do spend money, quite a bit of money. 
We stay in motels down here. I have quite a few times. I spend fish and money on the, on the bait shops at various other places. When we stay down here, sometimes we'll stay down at Cape Hatteras at the uh, camping area. The camping area, of course, we've got to buy food. So we go buy Food Lion down in Avon. So we spend money, a lot of money. Don't forget that. If you do nothing else, please don't forget that. Yes, we're tourists. We don't live here. But we are part of this area, and we enjoy this area just as much as you do in many times. So I just would impress upon each and every one of you to think about that, to think about the people who live here especially, but also those people who do not live here, who come down here all the time, and do enjoy it. You have a wonderful place here. Please don't screw it up, for God's sakes. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Brigham, excuse me, sure. um, what, do you travel down here the entire season, or is it off-season? When, when it's do you It's a combination. Travel? I mean, we, we come down uh, usually trying to stay away from the heaviest part of the season unless we stay in the campgrounds. Uh, it gets a little expensive in the motels and hotels in the area, so what we'll do is stay in the, in the campground sometimes. Uh, at other times, during the off-season, we will stay in the motels, uh, down at Buxton a lot of times, but up here. But our, I also belong to a four-wheel drive club, and we uh, come down here two or three times a year with them. And that's the last free area. Admittedly, you guys have got that. If nothing else, it's free, and that's a terrific thing. I just would like to see it continue because it is one of the few places. I go down to Hatteras. I spend $125 a year down there just to have the permit. But to have to have one up here too, that gets a little expensive, guys. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on Social Security. I'm disabled. So. Well, and, and my question for that is because this is being implemented before Memorial Day and mm -hmm. then through Labor Day. So the off-season You come down during the regular season, though, too. So that's the period of time that we're focusing on, so just right. so that you understand that. Right, and I appreciate that information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the rest of you. Thank you, Mr. Brigham. You're welcome. Lawrence Mason. First, I'd like to thank the Board of Commissioners for your time this evening. My name is Lawrence Mason. I reside at 4508 Greendale Road in the city of Chesapeake, Virginia. And I am here tonight as a representative of people who are not residents of your fine county, but utilize one of its greatest resources, Corolla Beach. I'm a member of multiple off-road vehicle organizations, a resident of Virginia, a firefighter, and an active duty Navy sailor stationed in Hampton Roads. And some of my fondest memories of living in this area are going to be those that are tied to Kerala. Uh, my first ever Jeep trip was here. Uh, I've brought my parents down from New York, who are also Jeepers. Uh, and I've have had some great bonds with citizens of Kerala, especially those of the uh, Karova Beach Fire Rescue Department. One of the key factors that draw us here at Kerala is the fact that it is the only free-to-use, publicly available off-road site in the area remaining. I understand this has led to concerns that the parking pass ordinance hopes to solve, such as environmental conservation, emergency services, public safety, and how that's related to the most common Kerala visitor, the day tripper. As a member of the Going Coastal Jeep Club, I was able to assist with our annual Butts on the Beach fundraiser. We raised over $1,500 for the Kerala Beach Fire Rescue Department and their mission of building a substation on the beach for additional apparatus. I was also able to take part in Virginia Four-Wheel Drive Association and Tidewater Broncos uh, beach cleanup, reinforcing our off-roading stance of leave it better than you found it. We also have members that have attended training to care for marine wildlife on shore, and we have members that assist the Corova Beach Fire Rescue Department when called upon, myself included. Most of these people fall into the day tripper demographic. These events and situations, along with many others, show the dedication of that demographic and the off-roading community as a whole in conserving the beach resource for future generations and keeping it safe for all to enjoy. As a member of the day tripper group myself, I am not fully opposed to the idea of a parking pass. Emergency vehicles, restroom facilities, beach maintenance, and the people responsible, they do all cost money. Why shouldn't all that enjoy the beauty of Corolla Beach help maintain it? We should. But I believe there should be more planning and consideration put into this process before creating policy. If the price of an annual pass were less than that of the National Seashore, many of us returning out-of-towners would likely purchase it. And for those that may not be interested in an annual pass, a day pass for a set fee, such as $10, seems reasonable. This has been demonstrated at the Uari National Forest off-road vehicle area with great success, where a person can purchase either a day pass or an annual pass for a set fee. Making those that are only visiting for a day or a weekend by a 10-day or a year-long pass doesn't seem to quite make sense. 
I think we all have the same interest in mind here, and that's keeping Corolla Beach safe and beautiful for all to enjoy. I think with further planning and research, a happy medium can be obtained where the services needed to do that are kept available without alienating what is possibly the biggest demographic of beach visitor. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mason. That currently is all that I have signed up for public comment. Is there anyone that came in late that would like to speak? My name is Christine Beaumont. I live at 162 Deerfield Trail in Shawborough. I um, do not have any investments in the oil and gas industry, but I do own a property in Corolla on Corolla Drive in on 904 Corolla Drive. Okay, this is in regard to the um, offshore drilling issue and the seismic, seismic testing. What are we saying no to? The green energy, green energy industry has reportedly spent $80 million to promote offshore wind and to fight coal production, as well as discourage any drilling of fossil fuels. I have to ask the question, why? For every dollar that the federal government spends in managing the federal oil and gas lease program, industry returns $54 to the economy. According to the Western Energy Alliance, the oil and gas industry paid more in taxes and royalties than those companies profited 23 out of 27 years. Industry estimates that over 4,100 jobs will be created and 210 million annual economic impact for Dare County alone and the surrounding counties. The estimate comes from a study completed by the um, Moffitt and Nickel. Curtech has never done a study, but by many years ago, millions of dollars a year were also forecasted to Curtech County. We have not had the time or the opportunity to research all that we are saying no to. Obama shut down the oil and gas industry lease program. With oil and gas exploration on federal lands stopped, it created a gap in energy production and opened the door for expensive renewable energy to subs be subsidized by local, state, and federal governments. $84 million of North Carolina taxpayer dollars were scheduled to be spent on a 2,000-acre Baker solar plant in Moyoc, North Carolina. Another $84 million of federal dollars were also given to the same Moyoc project. To date, only six local employees have been hired in Moyoc to care for the landscaping. Add to that the solar and wind industries, 80% discount on property taxes to local government. A huge disparity exists when comparing the renewable energy program and the oil and gas industry. One takes from the local and state taxpayers and provides minimal jobs. The other contributes almost half its profits to the local, state, and federal governments through royalties and taxes, provides billions in the creation of economies. Look at Texas as an example. If we say no, we are excluded from the state and local share of the royalties, royalties mandated by federal law. Drilling may still occur. It appears they do not need our permission to drill in international waters. However, they do need our agreement to pay royalties. We have no say in stopping this process. If we say no, there will be more royalties for the state and local governments that say yes. If all states and local governments say no, then the federal government gets to keep the royalties. Maybe this is why the federal government is not begging us to consider all the benefits to our area. Have any commissioners been contacted by the oil and gas lease program to date? Again, I ask, what are we saying no to tonight? We still have six more gates of opportunity to say no. Once you say no, the process is, is difficult to reopen if we want our royalties. What are we saying? Are we saying no to oil spills? We have no control over accidents, but 100 additional safety measures have been added to the requirements for offshore drilling safety since Deepwater Horizon. Who knows what the additional improvements can be expected in the next 10 years before drilling even occurs? Are we saying no to stop an oil still from polluting the ocean? Oil is organic, and there are microbes in the oil that actually eat the oil. The environmental nightmare that occurred in Louisiana in the Mex Gulf of Mexico had to do with the emollients and the chemicals that man added to clean up the spill. The, the ocean literally ate a lot of the oil and it just disappeared. What if we were to say yes to offshore drilling? I fully support President Trump's agenda to make America great again, don't you? Ms. Beaumont, are you getting close? Okay. Thank you. Drill, baby, drill is a major part of his economic recovery plan. Don't you agree that cooperating with a proven method of increasing economic growth is the right thing to do to help our county, 
our state, and most importantly, our, our president succeed in economic recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Beaumont. Anyone else like to speak to public comments this evening? With that, I will. Yes, sir. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Paul Gilbert, uh, 2471 Copeland Road, Suffolk, Virginia. I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Virginia Four-Wheel Drive Association tonight, and I do apologize. I will not be as uh, eloquent as Mr. Mason, but I'll try to do my best. Many of our board and some of our members have known for years that restrictions or permits were coming to the North Beach after the permit system was put in place for the southern end of North Carolina beaches. We also understand the need to find a balance between recreation users and the residents is the only way to have a civil relationship with the public. From what we've seen online and in person at the last meeting, this is a hot topic for both sides. We ask that you take your time to do this correctly and be specific, as specific as you can before implementing this. If it has to wait a year to pass is a far better decision than throwing out a rushed ordinance that, that for a lack of better words, has more gray areas than a black and white television. As, as of the last meeting, a long list of changes has been proposed, but it's all based on feelings. No hard evidence, studies, alternative traffic decisions, other beach ordinances or proposals appear, appear to have been overlooked. The rush of getting this ordinance through the board has raised some questions and has potential effect of more negatives than good. For example, has the county manager, da Daniel F. Scanlon II, been contacted to draft a plan on where and how the permitting will take place? What are the effects of traffic on 168 South around the permitting locations? How much traffic can, be designate, can the designated locations handle safely? How much will permits cost? There's nothing in the ordinance to describe how much it will cost. Lost my place. Over, the, over time, what is the limit of how much the cost can increase? Can the next board double, double it annually until the public beach is effectively closed to the public? What is, what is ultimately the economic and residential impact of this ordinance? Please understand that anything you do will ultimately affect the economy in this area. Your stretch of beach is the only beach in the Outer Banks that you can still drive on for free. This is a boon for your region which has helped keep your costs down. From food and fuel to everything in between, the money is, that is pumped into your economy helps keep prices lower than a lot of places in North Carolina, especially for a dead-end road. Tourism is your only industry, and small businesses are the backbone of this industry. Take a trip down to Hatteras, and you will see that a lot of businesses have closed their doors since the permitting system went into effect down there. Please don't let this happen here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Would anyone else like to speak? With that, I will close the public comments. Moving on to administrative reports. Report of unpaid 2017 real estate taxes and order of tax lien ad advertisement. And with that, if Mr. Sample would hurry up and get to the podium, that'd be great. Okay, great. Put four minutes on the clock. <laughs> Uh, again, my, my name is Tracy Sample. I'm a tax collector. Uh, tonight I'm here to give you a report of the amount of unpaid 2017 real estate taxes and to request that y'all order uh, the advertisement of the unpaid tax liens. When I first prepared the report, which is probably in your packet, um, of the $37.9 in real estate taxes, nearly $1.4 million of those were unpaid. Uh, as of last week, that amount had been reduced to $780,000. As it began last month, we sent out our first delinquent notices, and we collected about $600,000 before the end of the month. So far, we've collected 97.5% of the real estate taxes that were levied. This, uh, this not only includes the general fund, but it also includes special district taxes for watershed management, solid waste, water sewer. It also includes nuisance fees and septic tank inspection fees. Uh, nuisance fees are the cost borne by the county to remove or for such things as cutting overgrown grass, 
or demolishing, dem demolishing unsafe buildings you know, when the owners refuse to do so. Those inspection fees are the fees charged by Albemarle Regional Health Services for inspecting those provisional septic systems. And when the owners fail to pay, they contact me. We put a lien on the property, and we collect those taxes like, like we would property taxes. Um, this past year, we issued over 25,600 bills, and most people paid their taxes on time, while some paid a little late. Um, like I said, 97.3% of all 2017 taxes, both real and personal, have already been paid. Um, however, there are some type people that take a little extra encouragement to get those things paid. Uh, we currently have about 100 taxpayers set on, on payment plans. Last year, unfortunately, we had to attach, uh, we attached uh, 41, we had issued 41 wage garnishments. Uh, we attached the rents of at least two taxpayers, attached three bank accounts. Uh, we intercepted three tax refunds. We attached the unclaimed funds uh, held by the North Carolina Department of Revenue for 149, 150 taxpayers. And over the last three years, we've sold about 10 properties for, for, for non-payment of taxes, so that works out about three properties a year. Currently, we have eight tax judgments filed with the courts, and we're waiting the amount of time that's required to pass before we can ask the sheriff to sell that property. There's another 29 counts that we referred over to Ike and his staff for foreclosure. Uh, most of those won't go to sale. I hope none of them go to sale. Um, and most of them will get paid before we have to take a, actually advertise. Ike and Sandy does a great job of searching the title and making sure all required notices and advertisements are given. And Deputy Homer, he usually handles the uh, sales for, for the sheriff. We also have 11 taxpayers in bankruptcy. Those taxes will get paid either through the life of the bankruptcy or we have to wait till that bankruptcy closed before we can take action. The contract, contrary to popular belief, uh, bankruptcy cases do not wipe out most property taxes. We can still go after those. Uh, in the agenda packet tonight, there is an order to the collector to advertise tax liens. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 105-369, after I give him my report of the total unpaid taxes for the current year, the, the board must order me to advertise the tax liens. The tax lien advertisement must be run sometime between March 1st and June 30th. Uh, last several years, we, we have actually advertised in March. Um, the reason for the lien advertisement is twofold. One, it's an incentive or rather encouragement to people to pay their taxes. A lot of people pay their taxes just to keep their name out of the paper for no other reason. They, they, they do that. Uh, secondly, it's the first step in the tax foreclosure process. We cannot begin the interim tax foreclosure until at least 30 days after the tax lien advertisement is run into the paper. Um, that concludes my reports. Any questions, I'll try to answer them. If none, I would request that you adopt the order to advertise the 2017 tax liens. Mr. Sample, what was the amount that's unpaid at this time? Uh, on the 2017 taxes, real estate taxes, $780,808.88. As and that's of down from the 1.3? Yeah, the, the, the report I think is probably in your packet was done on February 7th. That was uh, uh, 1 million three hundred eighty some thousand. Thank you. I mean, it's not like we wait 30 days as soon as you haven't paid your taxes, we go out and do this. How much time from when they should have paid them until you're going to be advertising in March? When were the taxes actually due? They, they came due <coughs> on September 1st of last fall. Okay. They become past due January 5th. Excuse me, January 6th. January 5th is the last pay. You can pay those without interest. They become delinquent <coughs> January 6th. <coughs> and so six months really before we're even trying to, you know, taking legal action. For foreclosures, that's correct. Now, um, um, we can do other actions like the wage garnishments, attaching to bank accounts. Those things we can do January 6th. Okay. But for uh, 2017 real estate taxes, we have to wait at least 30 days after the lien advertisement. Thank you. Do we collect all the taxes? Do we collect eventually? All, we we in my settlement, I, th I think it tells you each year when I do that. It's about ninety nine point nine percent of the taxes we collect. And what happens to the other? Everyone wants to know how the other bacteria survives. But what happens with the the other point zero well, whatever? At, at a point, you know, as they get older, up to ten years, we can take action on. After ten years. We can no longer take action on those. And so typically, they just, just kind of roll off. How much do we roll off a year? Um, or, hold on one second. <clears throat> I 
best estimate, sorry about the leg. My best estimate would be looking at the uh, oldest year taxes and see what's currently due. We'll, we'll collect some of this, some of the 2008 taxes, but we probably won't collect a, a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> Motor vehicle. Let me get to the total. Okay. My total for 2008 taxes, which is the oldest I have, there's a little less than six thousand dollars due. Okay. And a lot of that was older motor vehicles. People would renew their tag. We send them a bill four months later. They move whatever. They don't pay it. Not a whole lot we could do if they moved out of state. So a lot of that is that type of stuff that okay. no longer happens. Now you pay your taxes up front. And if you move out of state, then you can re request a refund. But right. it used to be the other way around. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sample, how do these uh, numbers compare to other areas in the state or in the country? seems like we're doing pretty darn good. I guess I should have looked that up. I don't like to pat myself on the back. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty good relative. I think we've always near the top 20. And, and for our size, we're probably even near higher than that for a, for a small county. Right. I, I can get that for you and send it to you, but it's okay. I, I just curious. That lately. Thank you for that. Great work. Any further questions? Uh, with that, I'll open the floor for a motion. So move, Mr. Chairman, that we um, put this order into tax collector to advertise the tax liens on the books. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Sam. Thank you. Moving on to public hearing, PB 18-02, Lisa Brook, text amendment to section 4.3.2 of the United Unified Development Ordinance to allow housing for poultry as an accessory use to a single family dwelling in the general business zoning district. With that, I'll hand it over to Ms. Cicero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, text amendment you have before you tonight, it Simply put, it will allow um, uh, the housing for poultry as an accessory used to a single-family dwelling in the general business zoning district. A little his background history, um, a little background on this uh, particular case. Um, Ms. Brooke contacted co county staff wanting to put um, to have to have chickens on her property. Her property it is a single-family <coughs> dwelling and is zoned general business. The way our ordinance is has written currently that would not be allowed um, so she proposed a text amendment to essentially allow chickens to be kept um, as an accessory use to a single family home regardless of whether it was zoned single family mainland or for general business now we do allow chickens to be kept as single family mainland zoning SFM zoning district and single family isolated SFI in Knott's Island so this would just bring in all those uh, single-family homes that are zoned GB, gives them the same rights to keep chickens as zoned single-family mainland. Um, and the applicant is here tonight. So we have about um, 23, just under 2,400 parcels that are zoned general business, and of those general, uh, general business zoned parcels, just uh, around 700 of those are single-family single-family dwelling. So this is a pretty significant number of people that don't have the same uh, opportunity to have chickens as um, as other single-family. A zone of, of single-family dwellings that are zoned sing SFM. Um, this did, um, the planning board did hear this, um, and it was a very short meeting, but they did approve this uh, this text amendment. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, one point of clarification. This is just a text amendment change. This is not an actual use permit, correct? Correct. This is just a text amendment, a legislative decision by the board, changing the Unified Development Ordinance. Thank but, you. Ms. Cicero, with this text amendment change, would that affect any residents or, or housing developments or any other individuals that are currently in a general business single family area that knew that and knew that they would not have these now and then we'd be allowing this and then we'd be changing it for them as well well it would be any 
that would be any single family dwelling that is zoned general business. So um, now that's now, and this would not override anybody's um, restrictive covenants. If your residential <coughs> development doesn't allow that, this does not override them. But um, did that answer your question? Well, I guess, I guess if you have a bunch of single-family dwelling homes that are in a cluster in a certain area, and these other homeowners understood that they wouldn't have chickens there, and now we change this and allows them, is that going to, I mean, you're shaking your head no. I mean, what's... I, I think uh, if... A, I got lost. Okay. Okay. We just... We catch up. Not completely time. uncommon. If I understood this correctly, all all we're saying is that if you own a single family dwelling on the mainland that is in a GB, you get the same rights as a single family dwelling on the mainland. Zoned SFM, single SFM, family. SFM, correct. Right, correct. That they to keep okay. chickens. So, if if you're in a single family neighborhood mm -hmm. that the covenants permit you to, it doesn't change any of that. Change, this is the right. Mm -hmm. This are, is just GB, just single GB. family homes that are in GB. Mm -hmm. We already allow chickens to be kept in a, in, as an accessory use to uh, SFM zoning, and this just spreads those same rights to single family dwellings that are unfortunately zoned GB, or fortunately, depending on your point of view. So, I guess, question in general business if I've got Taco Bell and next door is a house. Here we go and with the Taco Bell sudden, again. <laughs> Why is it always got to be Taco, Taco Bell? Bell. Taco That's Bell. where the band goes after. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. And we drive the short bus. Uh, and so here we are sitting there, and all of a sudden I'm getting my you know, food, and I look over, and there's chickens next to me. That's allowed then if we change this? That's a business. Well, well, the business next door to a house, house. that's oh, house. in GB. A house in GB. Next to a house in GB. So the, the sure. chickens have to be fenced. Is that correct? Coop, correct. Right. Yes. So yeah. They're, they're going to have to be cooped. cooped and right. So you're not going to have them run around the Taco Bell parking lot. And chickens don't Unless get a KFC. <laughs> KFC. <laughs> We do. Yeah, we do. We do. Kentucky Fried Chicken. That would be a problem. Oh my gosh. That's it. That would be a problem. We do have standards. Guys. We got standards here. We do have. We do have uh, standards for housing for poultry. Um, and you, in association with a single family dwelling unit, you can only keep eight. Um, you cannot keep roosters. Uh, you can't slaughter the birds on site. Um, the birds have to be housed within a covered enclosure. Uh, no enclosure shall be located closer than 25 feet to any residential structure or lot line, and birds shall be kept within a fenced enclosure at all times. So if they are next to the Taco Bell, I would hope they would not be able to get out of their fenced enclosure. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. LoCicero? Uh, with that, I'll open a public hearing. I do not have anyone signed up for public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak? No one would like to speak. I will close the public hearing, and I will open the floor for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move for approval. Second. PB 1802, Lisa Brooke. Or well, Liza Brooke. Lisa? Liza. 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 We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to old business. Consideration of an amendment to Chapter 10 of the Currituck County Code of Ordinances establishing a, parking, a permitting system for beach parking. With that, I'll hand it over to Mr. McCree. Mr. Chairman, this matter comes before you for its second reading, an ordinance that will amend Section 10-64 of the Code of Ordinances uh, to regulate parking on the county's ocean beach. Um, I guess I'll just go over a couple points that were explained uh, at the last meeting, which, uh, first of all, is the authority for the county to adopt this ordinance. Uh, counties in North Carolina, uh, as municipalities on the coast, have authority to regulate uh, certain uses uh, on their beaches. Uh, the bottom line is that a county or city in North Carolina may not do anything unless the General Assembly has given it the authority to act in a certain way. Uh, in, in this particular circumstance or instance, the county has three uh, enactments by the General Assembly that gives Curry Tuck County the authority to regulate uh, motor vehicle use on the beach, including parking. First of all, 
General authority is derived by Section 153A-121 of the General Statutes, which gives a county the, uh, the authority to, by ordinance, define, regulate, prohibit, or abate acts, omissions, or conditions detrimental to the health, safety, or welfare of its citizens and the peace and dignity of the county. That's the broad authority. More directly, the General Assembly in recent years has amended Section 153A uh, or Chapter 153A to provide uh, at, at Section 145.3 that a county may by ordinance define, prohibit, regulate, or abate acts, omissions, or conditions upon the state's ocean beaches and prevent or abate any unreasonable restriction of the public's right to use the state's ocean beaches, may regulate, restrict, or prohibit the placement, maintenance, location, or use of equipment or personal property upon the state's ocean beaches, and this is important language, may otherwise enforce any ordinance adopted pursuant to this section or any other, or any other provision of law upon the state's ocean beaches located within the county's jurisdictional boundaries. Now, this, this particular statute was enacted to uh, address directly authority of counties uh, and municipalities have the same language in, in Chapter 160A, to regulate uh, by ordinance activity on ocean beaches within, within, in our case, the county's jurisdiction. Uh, that's because in North Carolina, um, while someone may have a deed that shows property ownership to the high water mark of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, there is what is known as the public trust area um, on the ocean beaches that despite someone's ownership of the ground, the public has a right by centuries of use to recreate and cross upon that privately owned property. Uh, more recently, about a year or so ago, the North Carolina Supreme Court uh, actually dismissed uh, the appeal from a Court of Appeals decision that has established that the law in North Carolina is such that the public trust area extends from the toe of the dune eastward uh, to uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this statute then gives the county the authority to enact ordinances and regulate activity within that public trust area. Lastly and more directly, Curry Tuck County has uh, direct authority from the General Assembly uh, as it relates to ordinances in Curry Tuck County by virtue of law adopted in 1985, amended again in 1998 and 2001. Uh, that provides that the county may by ordinance regulate, restrict, and prohibit, prohibit the use of dune or beach buggies, jeeps, motorcycles, cars, trucks, or any other form of power-driven vehicle specified by the county's governing board on the foreshore beach strand and barrier dune system. So th this is the authority by which this board of commissioners may enact this ordinance. I'm not going to go in great detail through the ordinance, which I did at the last meeting. <clears throat> I will denote the modifications that were made prior to your vote at its first reading, uh, and then a couple other uh, clarification or cleanup pieces. It's also important to note, as I noted at your first reading of this ordinance at your last meeting, that this is a regulatory framework. It intentionally does not have all details such as permit fees and where you may buy them and things of that nature because that's not something you normally would have in an ordinance. That is something that's going to, as this ordinance directs, come from the county manager's recommendation to you with regard to the administration of the program. Uh, and then the board, you, as you do every year, um, you will amend uh, your fee schedule to provide for the type of permits and whatever the price might be for those permits which would be, would, which should equate to the cost of running the regulatory program. Um, the, 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 there, there's been some press reports that you're going to have a 10-day, perhaps a 10-day a permit and an annual permit and what prices have been discussed, but that's nothing that has, is definitive at this point. Again, that's going to be acted on at a later time by this board upon recommendation of your county manager who is fully aware of that and sits to my left. So he, he knows what he's going to be tasked with doing. 
So uh, going into the ordinance itself on page two, um, line one, uh, paragraph C, and, and also what's changed since your last reading is that uh, the paragraphs that before did not have their own separate uh, section identification with a letter that has now been added for each <coughs> paragraph. So what is now paragraph C on line one of page two of the proposed ordinance? Uh, you will remember at your, at your last meeting you voted to add language that the beach permit uh, would not apply except during from the Friday before Memorial Day to Labor Day. And it's been suggested that there be some clarification as to well, what does Labor Day mean specifically in terms of a time frame. So I would recommend that you add there uh, the, the following language, 11.59 uh, p.m. on Labor Day, so that it would read from the Friday before Memorial Day to 11.59 p.m. Uh, on Labor Day, and that's consistent with similar type of language that occurs in other ordinances regulating use of the beach. Going on down to line 31, that now is section F, and this was an addition by the board that allowed for county residents residing north of the North Beach access ramp may obtain at no fee two additional parking permits that are not issued to a motor vehicle upon making application as provided uh, earlier in the ordinance. They still need to fill out an application process and show that they indeed are a county resident residing north of the North Beach access ramp to qualify for this permit. But that's something the board wanted to add you know, for, for persons who have visitors uh, coming to see them from out of, out of the area and will allow for them to be able to go down to the beach and park with a, a permit that they can then uh, use uh, in their motor vehicle. Um, uh, which is different than, uh, somewhat different because a uh, county resident or non-county resident property owner will be having, may get a permit, but those permits will be actually tied to a specific motor vehicle. And then lastly, on page 3, uh, line 15, which is now denoted as uh, subsection J, uh, this was not a section to which there was any language that was going to be modified by the adoption of this ordinance, but it's been suggested uh, that uh, perhaps, and, and this is a section that, that speaks to the authority of a law enforcement officer to seize a permit, not just a parking permit, but it applies to ATV or ORV permits as well, off-road vehicle permits, if the officer uh, determines that someone has violated another section of the, of the beach driving ordinance which relates to careless and reckless driving. Um, but it's been suggested that perhaps if there's some other uh, pending matter uh, for which the deputy or law enforcement officer would need to keep possession of that parking permit, perhaps as an evidentiary issue, that that ought to be clarified. So I'm suggesting that at that, that the end, end of that section, you, you add language, unless the permit is deemed evidence in another pending matter, so that it then would allow, require a law enforcement officer seizing the permit to bring that permit to the county manager within 48 hours unless that permit is needed as evidence in another pending matter. And then once this delivered uh, to the county manager, this is already a process that we have long established, uh, the county manager then, that, that then uh, starts an appeal process that involves the county manager and gives the per person whose permit has been seized an opportunity to be heard before uh, final determination is made as to whether they may, may maintain or retain the permit and whether they might be excluded for a period of one year from getting another one. Th there seems to be a lot of concern about the county's inability to operate uh, and establish and administer this program. But it, it's noteworthy that this ordinance <coughs> section that's being amended is a section that currently provides for permits that are required in order to use the beach by those who are using off-road vehicles. And that, again, has been something that's been established here uh, in the county for a long period of time. There is a, a permitting process that has been utilized for a long period of time very effectively without, uh, there seem, seems to be no problem with persons getting those permits. And so it's upon that foundation which I would expect that the county manager will build the administrative portion of this beach parking permit program and bring back his recommendation to you for your consideration and adoption. Uh, this ordinance, because it is on its second reading, may be adopted by you tonight with a simple majority vote of the board. 
and I'm glad to answer any questions. A uh, couple quick questions. Uh, Mr. Scanlon, there was a concern about that um, the county staff has not been prepared or working on this. Uh, can you clarify or where the staff is currently? I mean, have you been addressing and working in a plan and staff on board? And well, the, the county staff with uh, input from the sheriff's office have actually been working <coughs> on a, a general administrative procedure since the board started discussing this at your retreat. We are waiting for the final language to, to solidify where we're at. But we, as the county attorney just mentioned, we, we have a program that's been in place for several years, uh, a process in place to, to administer ATV permits, and we have developed or come to a, a consensus on a, a process that would be very similar to, to that in nature. Um, if the, the clerk has brought with her, uh, what we're envisioning is a... Um, has the clerk. <laughs> <laughs> it is a uh, a hanger that will go on the rear view mirror. Um, it'll be modeled. We have a couple of samples there and stuff. It'll be a, a little bit heavier stock. Um, the the ordinance basically sets up two different types of passes: one associated with the vehicle and one associated with the guest. So the the permits will be marked in that fashion. Uh, they'll be large enough so that <coughs> law enforcement, when they travel the beach, will be able to see them uh, prominently displayed, displayed at the rear, at the, on the rearview mirror. Um, people will be able to apply at either one of our tourism offices, either the one in Moyoc or the one in Kerala, or they could apply um, electronically. Uh, they could fax in the information, they could email in the information. Um, we, have, we, we accept that for ATV permits. The passes will be dated, they will be color coded so that, I, in fact, I think this is the actual close to the color for this year. The ATV permits, the, the parking pass permit, and the tour operator permits all will have the similar color associated with them. For oh. passes being issued to a vehicle, uh, the applicant would need to present a valid registration to a vehicle. We'll have the ability on the pass to take a permanent marker and write in the VIN number and or the license plate number so that when law enforcement, if law enforcement needs to come and look at the tag, they can associate it with a specific vehicle, make sure it's on the right vehicle. Uh, for those folks seeking the guest pass, and there's two different groups that can see guest pass, if you are currently in a rental program, uh, the ordinance allows you to get two passes. Um, the provision in the ordinance will require that particular person to go to the tax department to get a statement from uh, the tax assessor to verify that they, in fact, are in an active rental program. And by that, what we're looking for is that you have been paying occupancy tax on the rental of your property. Um, bringing that affidavit in or mailing it in or faxing it in. Uh, we will have a permanent marker. Will we be able to write the physical address on the permit, associating the permit with a physical piece of property? The other folks, is, if my understanding was, is if you currently reside north of the ramp, uh, th those individuals, too, can get two par parking par passes. They would come in, show some proof of ownership of the property. Uh, a, a utility bill would be sufficient. A property tax bill would be sufficient. Um, then we will again issue them a, a, a pass that's tied specifically to that piece of property. Um, I believe that covers... Um, and, uh, with the ATV permits, um, when I've gone in, I didn't, they were actually able just to look up my property. So you know, it, it wouldn't necessarily yeah. be necessary, my point is, to bring in, yeah. uh, you know, a bill or a property tax bill. Cause Correct. And, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be maintaining databases on both so that we will know whether um, if your house is under a property management company, the property management company on your behalf can come get the passes. You yourself can come get the passes. You, the, the permits will be issued. Uh, they'll be sequ sequentially numbered, and they'll go into a database so we know what was issued to whom. Um, so that database will be maintained. Uh, as, as the attorney mentioned, there's provisions in the ordinance that if you're in violation of certain um, vehicular ordinances on the beach, we have the ability to, to, to suspend or to, to void the permit for the remainder of the year. 
Mr. Scanlon, one quick question. Um, for years now, um, we've had the permitting system for reentry after um, a catastrophic event um, when we've had evacuations. So this isn't really much different than that process, correct? It, it, it isn't. In fact, um, the, these samples, it, it, this is actually what a reentry. So what we've talked about um, potentially going forward for 2019 would be to actually integrate both of these for property owners. Uh, this could actually be integrated into one and the same um, in that permit. Uh, the reentries have already been sent to the printers and they're already going out, so it precluded us from this year to be able to use that. But we'll be looking at could we integrate, uh, and they actually serve both purposes. And it would certainly stream pro streamline that process. Mm -hmm. and, and then we will be bringing, as, as part of your annual budgetary process, uh, you adopt what we call a master fee schedule where you set all the fees that we charge for for basically every service that we provide. That will be where the fee is set. Um, it is done because, as you've seen with this ordinance, uh, it is a, a lengthy and protracted process to be able to amend an ordinance by putting it in a master fee schedule. Uh, the board can go in and modify the fees or set the fees as soon as your, your, your next regularly scheduled meeting. So it gives you a lot of flexibility year to year on setting the, the, you know, what kind of permits you want to issue. If you want to go from, you know, daily permits, five-day permits, 10-day permits, it gives you flexibility as well as setting the rate. And that will be all brought to you as part of the, uh, uh, the budgetary process. And we'll be bring, bringing you something soon uh, to have it in place before May 1st. Mr. McCree, um, a question was brought up last time, and I think we had a discussion. There was some, some concerns about the regulation of the roads behind the dunes on private roads, whether the sheriff can enforce them and write tickets for that. <coughs> and I believe there's a way that that can be accomplished. And I think, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if the owner of that road sends a resolution to the board asking us to take care of that, then the board can approve it, and then we can direct the sheriff's office to start enforcing it and write tickets. Is that correct? Yes. The, the concern was uh, expressed was that people were just going to go behind be, because you're allowed to drive on the beach without a beach parking permit. It's only when you park uh, that the beach parking permit is required. So the concern was expressed that people were going to go behind the dunes, park along uh, neighborhood or community streets or in roads, and then walk over to the beach and therefore uh, evade the uh, the required beach parking permit. Uh, it's important to understand also that in North Carolina, counties have no authority uh, to construct, own, maintain streets and roads, unlike cities and towns. Uh, there is a statutory provision that states that a county may, uh, upon request of the owner or operator of a public vehicular area, and that's what these streets and roads are on the North Beach and the neighborhoods, uh, may request that the Board of Commissioners adopt parking regulations on the streets and roads that they own or operate. Uh, and, and so we have done this already and have it in our code of ordinances for a number of the communities and neighborhoods in Kerala proper um, that have come in over the years with their property owner associations who own the streets and roads and requested such regulation. So yes, it would be possible for those entities or organizations that actually have title to the streets and roads in Corova Beach, North Swan Beach, Swan Beach, or any of the other communities to make a similar request uh, to the Board of Commissioners to adopt a parking regulation uh, on their streets and roads. Um, if I could, I just wanted to answer a couple of the questions that were posed or statements that were made. Um, uh, one person uh, said that they uh, looked up some fees in the, in the other areas and questioned why we're doing what we're doing. And uh, it, the, the number one thing is, is about safety. And we keep saying that, but it's true. You know, we have this, this weekend before last, um, a Jeep club came down or some four-wheel drive club come down, and there was like 50 to 70 Jeeps out there. I've heard somebody say there were 70. They counted them. I saw them. I went down into town around 5, 30, 6 o'clock, and none of them were in any business down there. And they were clogging up Twitty's air pumps for quite a period of time. And, uh, and, and, you know, there are some responsible Jeep clubs out there. I'm a Jeep guy. I, I've owned a Jeep rental business. 
And I know that there are, there are plenty of trail clubs that believe in leaving it better than you found it, but um, <clears throat> those kind of things are exactly what we're talking about. These roads are our roads. This is how I get home every day. And if we don't get control over the amount of traffic that is up there, we've got a very real problem. <clears throat> no parked cars don't hit anybody, but it's the other ones that are traveling around. If we can deter some of that, then that's a good thing. Uh, for our visitors that have paid to be here. You know, we heard from people that they come down to go fishing, and many of the emails I got were from people that stayed in Hatteras. They didn't stay in Corolla or Kirtuck County. And, <clears throat> you know, we, we do want our businesses, businesses to succeed and have the benefit of your business. So if you're going to come down here, I would encourage you to stay here in Kirtuck County. Or stay in the four drive. You'll get passes with your house. <clears throat> and, and like you said, for the deputies, um, we've already talked with the sheriff's department. The county staff is involved with that. We've had quite a bit of discussion on this subject, uh, back and forth. Myself, the chairman, Commissioner Beaumont, we've sat down with, with our clerk and, and, and other staff and really talked this through. So while you don't see it on the outside looking in, it has been taking place, and for years this has been talked about, and there was actually a beach driving committee um, years ago that came out with many things that are in here today. We did discuss having a parking pass or driving pass to go out on the beach period, but you couldn't put a gate at the cattle gate, for instance, and try and deal with that traffic. Uh, we've had a gentleman come up here and state that they did a survey, although it was unofficial, it was well over 1,000 cars on the 4th of July week. <clears throat> While we do agree that, yeah, there's going to be a log jam a little bit at the, at, the, at the nexus when people show up to go out there, but can you imagine the backup on a heavy week if we just did a pass to go out there? We also recognize that people have to service the homes up there. Twitty has to run up and down the beach, Brindley Beach, Sun Realty, HVAC companies, water treatment companies, the power company. So we had to deal with those as well. So for now, a parking pass for us at least made a lot more sense in regulating this as a starting point. And maybe someday we will have to uh, permit the beach to go out there, uh, period. So um, I just wanted to cover that because it's, um, there is a lot, a lot of thought that went into this and discussion. And I want to implore you to check the county website. Our meetings are open to the public. When we had our retreat and discussed this item, it was open to the public. You can't comment, but you can certainly come in and see what we're saying and understand where we're coming from and the decisions we've made. So thank you. That's, that's all I have. I guess more of a statement than a <coughs> question. We're not here to discourage day trippers. At least we have other beaches. We have other parking areas. We've added a lot of signage. We've added a lot of you know, places that you can find out what we have available for you to go to visit. But I think we need a chance to take and see if these other options are working. I think the staff, the other commissioners, the citizen input has been invaluable. I think without a doubt, I think I'm, I'm impressed on every, every level. But are we ready to put it in this year? And not by the fact of the lack of work, it's the amount of work that shows it can be done, but should it be done this year before we find out if the other changes that we've made work? Thank you. A couple of points I'd like to make. Um, one of them is, and I think uh, Commissioner White brought it up, uh, the Board of Commissioners did not do this or consider this in a vacuum. We were actually asked to do it by uh, the residents of Corova Beach. Um, I personally have been up there. Uh, during some of the peak seasons and it really is a question of safety and it's not the people that are parked as was brought out that are the concern because again parked cars are like um, never mind uh, they're not going to hurt anybody uh, the concern is when kids who can only see mom or dad uh, and cannot see anything else than either the parents or the ocean are completely oblivious to the vehicles going up and down the beach and that's that's who we're trying to protect you know, our visitors, our guests, and our residents. And again, that was at the request 
of um, the residents of Corova Beach. Second thing that was brought up was um, <laughs> it addressed the, uh, the impact to law enforcement and being able to patrol that or affect that. The reality is we already have four uh, sheriff's deputies that their entire purpose in life is to enforce the ordinances on the beach itself. So there are no required, there's not going to be any additional law enforcement personnel added to the staffing right now. And there's no anticipation of them needing to work overtime to enforce what's already being enforced. And that's not expected to impact whatsoever operations uh, on the beach, number one. Number two, we have four deputies in addition to the four on the beach that are behind the sand dunes ensuring that, you know, the laws are being enforced back there too. Um, I, I did receive a comment by someone that, that was concerned that mainland uh, sheriff or law enforcement was going to have to come down and somehow supplement the, uh, the uh, Corova Beach. That's very unrealistic that that's going to happen. Um, on a good day, I think that's probably a one-hour drive. On a bad day, it could be even worse because um, you'll get stuck in duck. Um, <clears throat> so, and again, echoing what, what Commissioner Hall said, staff has put in a ton of, a ton of work. A lot of this is, gonna, is parallel to or very similar to what we're already doing with the ATV permits. It's not like we're inventing any new wheels here. So um, I, I think that the staff has put a, a great product together. I think, um, you know, with anything new, there's going to be a learning curve, and that's, that's the goal uh, by the, the board is to make sure that as many people, you know, find out about this as soon as possible. Uh, I think as was exemplified last meeting, you know, the question came in, can we do online? And the answer was, yeah, we can do online. So we're very responsive to how we can make this as easy as possible. And I think staff continues to, as is uh, uh, Mr. Scanlon, and ensuring that this is as seamless an issue as we possibly can make it. If we see problems, if folks see problems, you know, please let staff know initially or let us know, um, and we'll, we'll do what can be done to get it fixed. Um, again, the goal is safety. Um, and then I guess finally I would suggest, you know, the, the accusation was made that this is some attempt by the county to, to make more money. And the reality is when these types of fees are put in place, and I'm sure uh, our attorney can confirm that, they don't get to go anywhere else than servicing the, the community or the area or helping offset the fees incurred by the activity that's being permitted. Got um, let me another comment I'll just make here. Um, there was a, a comment in the public um, comment section about you know, living here a long time and seeing the the um, bonfires. Well, again, you know I, I remember the seventies living here. Yeah, I, I've been to the beach. Family went up there. We'd have bonfires. It was wide open at the time. And you're right; it has changed, um, changed to the point it's it's unbearable in the summertime to go up there. So I can appreciate the comments about how it was and where we're at now, and that's uh, that's one of the reasons why I am looking at it. Um, a couple of the other comments. I mean, I, I appreciate the feedback, the emails, the concerns people sent, and, and I and I do appreciate them because they helped me ask questions, work on some of the concerns people had, helped me think about this. But I also received a lot of feedback from residents who have lived here a long time, short term. Grew up here, beach side to side, and, and the comments was, yeah, I, I can, I can go with that. Why haven't we done it? You know, yeah, I'm fine with it. So there's been a lot of positive feedback as well. Um, and, and this is a living document. It, it can be changed, modified. A lot of all of our ordinance can be changed if we need to tweak them. Um, so yes, we need to start. Can it be adjusted or modified? Absolutely. We're always adjusting. We just did a text amendment on ordinance tonight on chickens. That's been in place for a long time. So, I mean, text amendments can be changed just like we did tonight. Changes can be made to this all the time. And um, I just think it's, 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 it's a good thing. And, again, a lot of the sentiments and comments I had was, you know, you know why haven't we done this in the past? That's Mr. all I have to say. Mr. Chairman, I have one other comment. Um, somebody did bring up how we define park. And knowing the way things are, we probably need to add that to the definition in the UDO. I did not see it in the table of definitions. It, it, it's not. Um, 
it's, it's actually not even a term that you can find in the chapter 20 of the motor vehicle statute in North Carolina, which speaks of parking, but does not define. Um, and so under, under the general rules of interpreting ordinances, uh, without a definition, uh, one would then consider the common ordinarily understood definition of park or parking by utilizing a dictionary, our courts have told us. So that would be the other manner in which it might be determined whether someone is parking. Now, law enforcement officers also have discretion, uh, and they, they exercise their discretion regularly on how they enforce uh, ordinances, laws, and statutes. So um, someone stopping to, to take a picture of a, a wild horse, for example, I suspect law enforcement officer is not going to cite them for violating the ordinance if they don't have a parking permit. Someone who is stopped uh, and has a, a fishing line in the water, I suspect law enforcement is going to check them to see that they have a parking permit <coughs> and determine that they are indeed parking. Uh, but if, if the board so desires uh, in an upcoming meeting to, to actually have a definition for the word park or parking, that can certainly be accommodated. I, don't think it's I like Webster. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, Miss, you know, most people know what parking is. If it's in park or the parking brake is set, you're parked. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just speak to, um, we had quite a few citizens bring up that we have not listened to what they have to say. Um, we didn't give them the opportunity to put give their input. But in 2011, as Mr. Commissioner White um, mentioned earlier, we had a driving committee that looked at the outer banks of, of Curry Talk, including Kerala and the Karova area. The recommendations that came out of that um, committee, um, I appointed Mr. Hall to that committee back in 2011. Um, for his experience in law enforcement. And that board was made up of business owners. It was not top heavy of just beach um, residents and property owners. It was expanded to the mainland. And the recommendations that came out of that committee, um, we put a lot of that into place. The signage through the Kerala Village, throughout the Outer Banks, and it was brought to my attention um, since our last meeting that we haven't put any signage in the off-road area. And that's a little more complicated to put signage in the off-road area. And I've had a conversation with our county manager. Um, there's then, as Mr. McCree had stated earlier um, about the property rights and, and where the, the resident's property goes to the Atlantic Ocean. So there are some things that, that could be done but there's a lot more complication to that as far as um, putting signage up in the off-road area. We will have preparation and signage prior to the off-road area. But just so that people understand that we have gone through this process and, and had lots of citizen input. So I just would just remind everybody that, that we've, <laughs> in 2011, put the staff through I want to say probably about 10 meetings. Yes. It was about a year and a half long <coughs> process that you participated in. As well as, you know, conditions, yes. And, and, you know, the folks on that advisory committee gave some great recommendations, and all we're doing is finally getting it down on paper and putting it into effect. So I, you know, I want to go on record that I am supporting what was recommended to, to us, and hopefully we'll, we'll get something going. And as Mr. Payment said, this is a working document, um, but I, I think that we've had lots of input, and I would encourage those of you that have just moved here or just started coming to the beaches, um, at, you know, just give us an opportunity to, to make a difference. Give it a chance. <coughs> Any further comments? Uh, if I could, real quick, um, I want to thank the citizens for your participation, your emails, your phone calls, your conversations. Um, as everyone here said, we've had multiple conversations um, throughout this process. This isn't something that was dreamt up overnight. Um, it's been years in the making. Um, no ordinance is 100% perfect. Uh, you could sit here for five years and not have a perfect ordinance. Um, so we will keep our eye on it um, to see how it progresses, and we will be listening to feedback from the community. Um, I want to congratulate or commend the staff 
um, for being on top of things. Um, they could see this coming. Um, they've done a really good job of getting prepared for this to be taking place. Um, so thank you for that. And to the commissioners um, for all the work they've done, the countless emails, the phone calls, the conversations, again, uh, we've gone back and forth on many occasions about this. We've listened to the citizens. The citizens wanted the season shortened. We shortened the season. Uh, many recommendations you made, uh, we made the changes, and we feel we have a good ordinance to move forward with. Um, so with that, if there's no further discussion, I'll open the floor for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to approve with the uh, proposed changes that were presented here this evening. I will second that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. We have five ayes and one no. The amendment passes. The amendment passes. Thank you. Um, moving on to new business. Resolution criteria for design build on the public safety center. I'll hand that up. If, if I can uh, give a couple minutes for folks to head out. Take five. Five minute recess. We'll re, uh, get back at 725. folks okay folks we're back in session moving on to new business <clears throat> resolution criteria for design build on the public safety center but that'll hand it over to mr. Scanlon uh, mr. thank you mr. chairman um, there are a couple a handful of uh, statutory approved me mechanisms that the <coughs> counties can use to build facilities uh, one of them being a design build uh, in fact, I, I believe the last two buildings the county built, we, we built under this provision. Um, it's a little different than how historically buildings were built in the fact that under design build, instead of the architect working under a direct contract with the county, unit of government and then you bid out to a general contractor, and under design build, the architect and the general contractor work together in the design and the delivery of the building. So you're actually bidding out for both services under a single contract. The general thought being is if the architect worked closer with the general contractor, uh, that it eliminates conflicts in design and actual building means and methods and, and has the potential of eliminating or certainly decreasing the amount of change orders that you experience uh, as a project is, is coming out of the ground. Um, it also is a mechanism for uh, the, the, the design team to give you a firmer price on upfront on what the project is going to cost. And again, our, our last two builds have been done under design build contract. Um, in doing this method, it does require a couple findings and a couple things procedurally that the commissioners have to do. Uh, one of them is to adopt a resolution uh, that lays out five specific findings. Uh, the statute does not require that resolution to actually be done in an open session and formally by the board, although uh, the staff felt like it would probably be more appropriate if we did that. And so tonight in your agenda package, you actually have a resolution uh, that lays out the five findings um, about why we think this is a preferred method. Uh, so from the experience we've had in our last two builds, for them coming in under, build, under budget and designed um, to, to meet the specifications requirement of counties, we feel like that is a preferred way to go. And so you have a resolution in your agenda package that we're asking you to adopt, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have specifically on the resolution. Mr. Scanlon, just one quick question, whether it's under the resolution or not. A um, couple of concerns have always been had thrown at me in the past with design-build projects in, for the county. And I don't believe there's a requirement for the general contractors when they go out for bid to, to look at local or more regional type of contractors, but um, it, would there be some type of advertisement to let local businesses know that there's something going on that we can, if they're interested, they can contact somebody or a general contractor or something? Um, th there, there is an advertisement piece to it. Uh, it, it. If the board was to adopt the resolution tonight, uh, the staff will finalize a, a RFQ, a request for qualifications. Uh, that will be advertised and, and publicly placed, whereby 
architects can select general contractors. They can bring a team together. The general contractors then would start looking at what subs they would bring to the table. So there is an opportunity for the, the for business owners to in construction trades to understand that we're moving forward a project and for them to contact the general contractors. Uh, there isn't a provision uh, or an allowance that would let us uh, mandate or dictate uh, that general contractors have to use specifically uh, local businesses, although uh, there is a requirement that historically underused, underutilized businesses, there is a requirement for the general contractors to show good faith effort. They have reached out to uh, women-owned or minority-owned businesses, and so there is a requirement for that, but nothing specifically that says they have to use a current county business. Any further questions from Mr. Scanlon? With that open floor for a motion. Motion for approval. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on. Resolution expressing the Kurtuck County Board of Commissioners' opposition to offshore drilling and seismic testing. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. McCree. Mr. Chairman. The board requested uh, the drafting of a resolution to, to be considered at tonight's meeting to express as as it's drafted to express Curry Tuck County's uh, opposition uh, to offshore drilling and seismic testing, um, particularly as it was brought back to light through the president's recent executive order 1375, uh, in which he ordered development of new Outer Continental Shelf oil and gas leasing program for oil and gas development and associated seismic testing. Um, I guess if you see in the press, um, I think every coastal county in North Carolina has now adopted uh, such resolution in opposition and so uh, it was it's been in your agenda package and so it's commended to you for your consideration tonight thank you mr. McCree uh, if I could make a comment on that um, I had some discussions with some commercial charter fishermen <clears throat> um, and uh, that go out in our oceans on a daily basis and some of the feedback, and they brought back, brought back specifics, and they brought back maps and charts and uh, GPS coordinates of areas that <clears throat> were very known for, for predominant um, fish and their catches over historical. They've got data that they showed that. And um, there was a few times they couldn't believe that, talking to other captains, they, they weren't catching anything out there. They couldn't understand why. Well, then they found out that there was seismic testing going on in that area and their concern was at that time that that was causing issues with the fishing um, again they couldn't no, no scientific data on it but that's the only thing different that they found and their really their concern was there's not enough known at this time whether that did affect it or not but there a lot of fishermen I spoke to had a big concern about that right now with the fishing and their charter and their businesses <coughs> Speaking with the <clears throat> people in my district, um, you know, it's the coast. They're they're in support of what we're trying to do here tonight, and definitely oppose offshore drilling um, in any in any form or, or seismic testing. So, um, <clears throat> I think we saw a few emails to that effect, um, but uh, in talking with them, they're just they're in agreement with us this evening on this moving forward. Um, I've had quite a few people contact me and um, of course in the media and, and elsewhere stating that they were disappointed that we as a board didn't jump on the wagon immediately to make a decision and as I recall it at our retreat the conversation that I recall was we didn't want to make a decision in that time because each one of us needed some additional education is is that a fair statement that um, at our retreat and and since then we've we've gotten some more information and you know i am on record against drilling for oil um but as it's been brought to my attention there are opportunities for others the federal government to still drill um our neighbors in surrounding states can still drill and and i'm not a chemist i'm not a biologist i don't have all the facts but i will say that um us saying no um, 
won't prevent someone else from drilling into our our area. So we need to be cognizant of that and, and take that into consideration. Because um, just as it was said earlier in our public comments, um, this is this is a very difficult decision. But we should be applauded for taking the time to review some more information and get educated. I, I couldn't make a conscious uh, decision, and I know it affects our industry. Um, we are a sportsman's paradise. We have um, our, as, as you stated, fishing. But there's other studies that are out there that, um, you know, speak to this, and, and they have the information. I just, I just want the public to know that we made a conscious decision to educate and, and, and get information further before rushing to a decision. And, and I think that the citizens should appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, if we could go to the next slide. Do we have the slide? No. So this is in the, the chart's in the agenda, but it's not up there. No, okay. Okay, so part of what happened in our retreat is that we um, it, did not feel that we had the information to make a decision at the time based on the information that we had before us. And I'm going to ask each board member up here what scientific data have you gathered since the January retreat that has given you cause for your opinion? What experts have you spoken to? What organizations? What what information have you gleaned that is causing this rush to this decision? Because I would suggest that's exactly what we're doing. Well, I, I did speak to expert fishermen that have fished these waters for numerous years, and they, they did produce maps. They showed the shelves. They showed where the testing was being done, and they showed the fishing area, and they showed the data what the fish caught versus non-fish caught with the testing going on. So that's the data that was presented to me. Uh, if I could, Mr. Beaumont, um, I would consider that a gotcha question. Um, no one would be, would be prepared to answer that question in any way, shape, or form this evening. Um, yes, some of it is based on emotion. Um, some of it is based on the fact that this is a $2.2 .2 billion industry that we live by. Um, I myself am not willing to take the chance of someone losing their job for financial gain because of some oil being drilled offshore. Um, People rely on this industry. People have made their lives on it. People have built everything around it. Um, and I am not willing to take that chance uh, for any financial gain whatsoever. People talk about it brings jobs. We already have jobs. Everybody here has a job. Everybody who lives on the other banks has a job. Um, it's supported primarily by the tourism industry. Um, and that's not a chance I'm willing to take. So, um Unfortunately, it's in your agenda packets. Um, if you all want to go there, and I, I'm sorry, I should have asked that it be placed up on the, the monitor for our, for our public, um, is the chart that's the process that's used by the Bureau of Ocean Energy um, Management, whom has agreed to come speak to this Board of Commissioners, but due to their schedule, they're unable to do it until April. Hence, they were not able to make tonight's meeting or they would have been here. Um, part of what they brought out, or part of what this chart is showing, is the process by which oil and gas leasing is done. Um, and currently, there are eight specific gates that, are, um, that at any time we can reject or we can decide the risk is too great to continue, and, um, and that's that. Uh, we're currently at the end of the second gate, which is a 60-day 60 60 comment period. And um, I would offer you that this is significantly premature in, in making this decision. Um, in reference to the fishing, I'm going to read to you a quote. And this quote comes from um, Mr. Uh, he's the chairman, Brent Fulcher, who's the chairman of the North Carolina Fishy, Fisheries Association, NFCA, who says uh, in their letter of support, said that they believe the door should be kept open for discussion, debate, and negotiations such as stabilized inlets and infrastructure. 
Chairman uh, Fulcher states, finally, we must use caution and explore sustainability, but we must proceed. Um, in addition to that, the, uh, the North Carolina Republican Party in District 3, which we belong to, they actually went on record also supporting uh, the continued exploration of options, not necessarily in full support yet, but certainly not cutting that off. And as part of their resolution, they state, where, and uh, for the record, Congressional District 3 um, is us, Dare County, I believe Hyde County, Pamlico County. Uh, their comment was, information from the Quest Offshore Resources points out. There are about 15 counties in District 3. If you can name them all, that'd be great. I can't name them all. <laughs> then don't just name the oceanfront ones. It's not, it's not one, you're, you're, you're specifying the ocean in this district. If you know what, what the three are that you're spelling out, then name them all. Let's okay. be fair I'm about sorry. it. I'm sorry. I won't name the counties. Just third district, congressional district three. Um, benefits of OCS, gas and oil development to the state of North Carolina. Impact to North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia combined by 2035 would be 116,000 jobs, 56 billion in cumulative spending. Nine billion annually and nine point five billion from revenue sharing. Um, I guess I su would suggest um, you know there's been a couple of infamous events. There has been over a hundred improvements to the system since the the um, Deepwater Horizon, and uh, again, you know. None of us are really qualified to make an educated, oh, very good. Um, none of us know the science behind this, and I don't proclaim to be one either. I'm not prepared to say I'm support of, of drilling in our offshore or oil exploration yet. But I'm also, um, you know, fully capable of saying I don't think we, we still have not heard from folks that can give us the accurate pros and the cons. The, the risk to North Carolina uh, by Virginia is just as significant as, was off, as if it were off our coast itself. Um, a disaster in Virginia, I think we could expect that to be on our beaches as well. So you, we, would, we would have all, and as the northernmost county of the third congressional district, we would suffer the greatest loss without any possible return or potential benefit from that exploration. And to reiterate the comment that was made earlier today, the federal government does not need our approval to do it one way or the other. We do not have the ability to control what a state to the north of us does, but we do have the ability to control what happens in our state. Or our county. And our county. Thank you, Mr. White. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, am I worrying about what happens to the state of North Carolina? The county of Curry Tuck, they're both on our minds. <clears throat> it's a tough decision, a lot of things that we have to decide. And trying to get all of the information, we didn't originally go out and say we're going to support it or not support it because we didn't have a chance to give everybody a chance to read. I read what I could. I also talked to some fishermen to see what their thoughts were. They showed me some charts, wasn't anything scientific. I talked to a couple of old sailors that talked about years ago when they were doing sonar off the coast and animals that were being beached on, you know, Carolina, Virginia beaches. I see now we still have animals being beached. We don't know what's causing that. I hear about, well, there have been 100 safety innovations since deep water. Well, in theory, I hope that we never have to test them to see if they work. But am I ready to take and put my my feelings and my beliefs and my county at risk, I'd say at this time I'm not ready to put them at risk. When more information comes available, we can't always revisit this. And I look forward to any other information that gives me the opportunity to learn more. Uh, speaking and speaking with Boehm, you can always say no. It is significantly more difficult to say yes. Agreed. And uh, I would also offer that um, if, 
you know, the threat of marine mammal uh, injury has, has been a very popular comment or a very popular topic and subject for research. And if anyone has, would like to see the process that's used to do seismic testing to present or prevent injury to those mammals, I have that documentation and would be happy to share it with you as well. Any further comments? With that, open the floor for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to, to approve. I would second that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Resolution passes five to one. Moving on. Board appointments? Mr. Chairman, that would be me. Um, I have an appointment to the Board of Adjustments, and I would like to appoint Tom Roddy. Um, Joe Kovacs was my appointment, and due to some personal items, um, he needed to resign, so I would like to appoint Tom Roddy to replace him. Mr. Roddy has served um, prior on the Board of um, Adjustments, and I would like to, for him to take the seat um, that Joe Kovacs had as a board member, not as an alternate, because of his experience. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Any more board appointments? Uh -oh. I'm sorry? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. We, we want to check. We were with you until you said to replace. I, I think by ordinance, you have a process when someone new comes on, they go through the alternate process. We just want to check and make sure that. Yeah, and this, he was an alternate, is that correct? But he was replacing that seat, so it, is that, it doesn't matter if it's. That we, we, okay. We're, okay. The, the, attorney, the attorney's looking at that. Okay. Yeah. While we're researching. <laughs> my, my goal is. <laughs> I, uh, I also have an appointment to the uh, Board of Adjustment, so if anyone's watching or listening tonight, um, Please uh, feel free to contact me or, or fill out an application and send it to our lovely uh, county clerk. And I also have an opening <laughs> so for the Board of Adjustment. So I know we have some applicants. We're always looking for more for any of the boards. Please let us know. <clears throat> do, 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 do. <laughs> Leave it to me. To no, because there's a meeting Thursday night that I want him. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I will um, take my motion and amend it to um, appointing Tom Roddy to the Board of Adjustments and uh, let the process. Yeah, I think it would be appropriate now that since the vote has already been taken that uh, – a, a, a member voting in the affirmative may ask that the motion be reconsidered. If that motion passes, then you may reconsider the action taken. I would be asking for the motion to be reconsidered. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. I open the floor for a motion again, Ms. Gilbert. I will make an appointment to the Board of Adjustments um, appointing Tom Roddy to that board. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Any further board appointments? Moving on to consent agenda. Motion for approval. I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to Commissioner's report. Commissioner Beaumont. I had the pleasure of attending the uh, Board of Education uh, meeting last Thursday. And um, I wanted to go over a presentation um, by uh, Miss Jenna Akers, who is uh, um, a, one of the senior advisors to the Board of Education, and she gave a presentation on helping to in, uh, increase or improve the um, physical security in our schools. Uh, the device that she came and presented to the board was a, um, a fairly simple device that basically would be retrofitted on the, the classroom doors to help 
provide uh, some degree of protection to law enforcement could come on scene. Uh, uh, Chief Deputy Biker was there and had worked with her uh, as part of her senior project. And I just wanted to give a public uh, commendation uh, to Ms. Akers. It was a well done, well presented, <coughs> and an outstanding um, um, suggestion uh, for our school system to consider to improve the safety of our, our students. Um, she did this independently. She, uh, this, from what I understood, it's something she wanted to leave the Curta County school system. Uh, when she graduated this year, she wanted to leave it behind as, as part of her legacy. And uh, I gotta say, uh, she did an outstanding job. That's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Hall? They said the groundhog saw his shadow. Well, spring is in the air because the Girl Scouts are out selling cookies. And they hit me up twice in front of the stores and I'm waiting for the third time because I do like Thin Mints and they're great in the freezer. So folks, support your local Girl Scouts. Buy a box of cookies. <laughs> Commissioner White. That's, that's tough to follow up. <laughs> I don't have anything this evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Commissioner Gilbert. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on Friday the 5th, uh, Gosh, the third, I mean, I've my dates. Last Friday, how about that? Um, Commissioner Hannig and I attended the first dedication for Habitat for Humanity Home in Currituck County. And this was part of a program that the State Employees Credit Union um, has put money into. And, and I don't have all the figures, and I apologize for that. Um, but having a Habitat for Humanity home built in every county in North Carolina. As of February 28th, they had 38 completed homes in North Carolina. Um, as of this past week, the first week of March, and by the end of the first quarter of this year, they will have a home either ready to, to be um, closed on with mortgages or the homes will be started so that they will have a Habitat for Humanity home in every county in North Carolina. And I just want to reach out to um, the Moyoc Women Club. We have um, we did some painting and some just some freshening up for this family. And I just want to thank everybody that attended that. Um, Wes Liverman and his company did a lot of the work that was done, the construction work and the preparation for this home, but it was just such a moving and touching um, opportunity to give a, a home to a family, and they were well-deserved, and there's criteria, so it's not just, they don't just pick a name out of hat, it, it goes through the um, social services, and it is a long, drawn-out process, and this particular applicant that was chosen to receive the Habitat House in Currituck County um, the process started almost two years ago, but I just want to commend the State Employees Credit Union for putting this program into place and, and matching the dollars. I mean, it's, it's, it's a significant amount of money that they are um, putting forth um, to make this project work. So if anyone is interested in Habitat for Humanity, you can look up on the website, which is habitatnc.org. Um, if you want to contribute or donate to that process um, or the program, please do so. We do have some other opportunities for some Habitat <coughs> homes, but this being the first one in Currituck County, I was very, very proud to be a part of that process and, and affording this family um, a home. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Commissioner Payment? Nothing at this time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, as Ms. Gilbert said, we did uh, attend the, the Habitat House, and um, it's probably one of the coolest things we get to do is go to functions like this. Um, I know I say it all the time here, but it's true. The, the degree of um, volunteers in this county is, is truly commendable and somewhat, somewhat outward amazing. Um, these folks came together and helped this family that was in need, and if you were there and your eyes were dry, you're not human. Uh, it was it was truly a special day, and I was extremely glad to be part of it. Um, this morning, I went to the Albemarle Hope Line um, Appreciation Breakfast. Um, Albemarle Hope Line uh, does lots of things for 
um, women and children that are in need. Um, uh, the work they do is, is again, amazing. Um, and uh, it's real important for folks out there to know that when you're in a situation, you're not alone. Um, you don't need to be afraid to ask for help. You call someone, you ask them for help. There are people out there that will help you. Um, so uh, again, it was, it was a truly special morning. Um, they do amazing things, and I was proud to be part of that as well. Um, and that's all I have this evening. Uh, and if, if I could hand it over to the county manager report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at a previous meeting, I had reported that uh, NCDOT had approached the county about a construction project along Waterloo Road that would require <laughs> that road to be completely shut down. Um, at that time, I had mentioned that they had targeted March 17th. Um, since that announcement, we were approached that there was an event being scheduled or had been scheduled at the campground at Waterley, and so um, in consultation with NCDOT, that date how has been changed. So starting at 8 o'clock on April 6th, it's a Friday, uh, DOT officials will completely shut down Waterley Road uh, to replace two culverts. They're anticipating the work should take less than 24 hours. Uh, the folks that travel that road regularly will notice that beginning April 2nd, uh, some of the prep work in advance of that will begin. And effective April 2nd, Waterloo would actually be down to one lane uh, as they try to uh, move that project forward and in the least disruptive manner as they can. Uh, we were also on a different topic. Uh, we had a, a recent conversation with uh, the state of North Carolina who has raised some concerns about the manner and method in which we are collecting our white goods. I think I reported this to the board. Uh, so I did want to go ahead and, and start putting this out publicly um, that I would be anticipating, you know, July 1st, a change in what kind of material is acceptable at our convenience centers, specifically items that have compressors and take Freon, refrigerators, freezers, and air conditioning units. Uh, it appears will no longer be acceptable at the convenience centers themselves. They'll have to be transported to the transfer station, and the county staff will make every effort to get that public health information out in advance of uh, July 1st. Um, last item is a, is a point of clarity for the, for, for the board. Uh, the attorney has passed to me. Uh, pursuant to the UDO, when we have a vacancy in the Board of Adjustments, and this appears to be unique to the Board of Adjustments, uh, when you have a vacancy per ordinance, uh, an alternate, an existing alternate steps into that vacancy, and the next appointee would go into that alternative. So Mr. Roddy will serve as an alternate uh, until time comes for him to be able to advance up. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With that, I will call for a motion, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passed unanimously. I will now go into special meeting of the Tourism Development Authority, and I'll hand it over to Mr. Scanlon. Mr. Chairman, you have a, a single budget amendment in your agenda package tonight for the Tourism Development Authority's consideration. Um, we have been doing some extensive air conditioning repairs at the Whalehead Club and the budget amendment for tonight is the need for an additional $9,782 to complete those repairs. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any okay. questions for Mr. Scanlon? Keep it going. Motion for approval. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Now call for a motion to adjourn the meeting of the TDA. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. We'll now move into special meeting of the Ocean Sands Water and Sewer District and move into closed session <coughs> pursuant to GS 143318-11A3 to consult with the current county attorney and to preserve the county, county attorney client privilege in the matter captioned. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I, I thought, I'm sorry, but you may also add, and the attorney for the district. And the attorney for the district. Uh, Coastal Corporation versus Ocean Sands Water and Sewer District. Thank you. You, you need to, do you need a second of that. Second? Oh. second. I apologize. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Hearing none. <laughs> Motion passes unanimously.